Good evening. I want to wel welcome you to the University of Northern Iowa Center for Energy and Environmental Education. My name is Carol Yates. I'm the series coordinator for Building for the Future, Energy Efficient Alternatives. Um, and I do this series with Pat Higby, who's the energy educator at the center, and also Lindsay Worth, who's the communications intern. Our sponsors for the series are Aquila, Alliant Energy, Black Hawk County Solid Waste Management Commission, Cedar Falls Utilities, the Iowa Energy Center, Mid-American Energy, and Waverly Light and Power. We thank all of them for their support of energy efficiency and building. Um, the series is archived on the UNI CEEE website, so you would go to www.uni.edu slash CEEE, and on the left-hand side it says Building for the Future, and we have the spring programs up there, and we'll have the fall programs up as soon as possible. Tonight our speaker is Lonnie Gamble, an author and expert on sustainability issues. He's going to be talking about his home that makes use of straw bale construction and numerous other renewable energy forms. He's a founding faculty member of the four-year sustainable living program at Maharishi University of Management in Fairfield. Lonnie, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Carol. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody here at CEEE, Pat and Bill and Kamiar and Carol and uh, all the folks here, the, all the great work. I've, I've always been a, a big admirer of everything you guys are doing up here and, and the building you've created and the facility you've created here. How many people have some experience with straw bale or some form of natural building? Anybody? Anybody live in a straw bale house or the big bad wolf came and blew your house away? No? <laughs> um, so this is my home. Uh, in Fairfield, and we'll see. We'll be seeing more about it. Uh, and I've been living. Uh, I haven't paid an electric bill in 15 years. I've been living off the grid for 15 years, with solar and wind power alone. My whole neighborhood is actually solar and wind powered. And um, uh, we. This presentation was prepared on solar powered computers. What I'm, this is a little overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about a little overview of natural building and where straw bale fits in. And please feel free to ask questions uh, as we're as we're going through here. Uh, the history and renaissance of uh, straw bale building, uh, a little bit about design issues, uh, design considerations, um, plastering, energy performance, building codes, show you a few examples, and talk about some resources if you want to get involved in straw bale building. Uh, first thing I wanted to say, though, as a little bit of an int introduction, is there's this kind of um, pervasive myth that growing the economy is shrinking the ecosystem. And in the economy we have now, that's true. But if we create an economy that has a more local base, where that's based on uh, renewable natural resources like solar and wind energy and the annual re annually renewable harvest from organic fields, then um, this isn't quite true anymore. Um, in nature, if something grows, it's good, a tree or a child. Um, so I think straw bale fits into that, that kind of ethic of, of, of local we really well. Just wanted to say a little bit about the great work of generations. The great work of my generation was creating the Mall of America in suburbia, which James Howard Kunstler calls the greatest misallocation of resources in human history. And the upcoming generation, I feel like their great work is to do really good urban and village design to make dense human settlements the most attractive places to live, to design with nature as a model and mentor. And here's, a, here's a, an icon of, uh, of, uh, of my generation, and our motto is, if brute force isn't working, we're not using enough of it. And this is the next generation, and you can see maybe one of their icons in the back, which is a, a big solar array. These are some of my students in the Sustainable Living Program at MUM. This is a little quote from Nader Khalili about natural building. Anybody, Nader Khalili is, a, uh, is an architect who uh, runs something called the California Earth Institute. It's uh, mainly earth building. Any, anybody in this world should be able to build a shelter for his or her family with the simplest of elements available to all. The elements, earth, water, air, and fire. A family should be able to learn the techniques, move to a piece of empty land, and then, with some water and simple tools, build themselves a house using the earth under their feet. That simple yet profound technology exists today. We have inherited it from our ancestors, and we must learn how to use it and improve on it. 
And there's, this is my house, and we'll be talking quite a lot more about that. I just wanted to give you a little feel for what some of these buildings could look like. Um, I want to do a little bit of an overall introduction to natural building and to kind of place straw bale into that. Uh, this is a little straw bale building that's in France. Um, there's a lot of talk about green building, this idea of green building. And does anybody have an idea? What, is, what do we mean by when somebody says green building? What do you have? Yeah. You use as many natural things as you can. You compete on the environment as little as possible. Sure. You that's use it. recycle. You use low energy consuming methods. Low en yeah, low embodied energy in the products, those, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I think you know, people have a general sense, but it's, a really, it's, it's come to mean almost like natural. You know, it's really hard to know exactly what it means. And I, you know, I look at, um, look at the intersection between natural building, conventional building, and high performance building. As, and this is the area I think a lot of people would call green building. Um, and you can have um, very, you know, there's an overlap here. You can have very conventionally built houses built of natural materials. You can have unconventionally built of houses, houses that have a high energy performance that are built of natural materials and, and the overlap in between. So it's quite a, green building is quite a broad field. Um, some other natural building methods other than, than uh, <coughs> straw bale or stone, rammed earth, earth bag, which I'll show you an example of, which is good for foundations and straw bale for simple buildings, cordwood masonry, cob, papercrete, greencrete, fast wall, timber frame, light straw construction, and straw bale, which I look at as a really durable solution for our area. Uh, durable meaning that um, you know you can do a lot of research and you can look around for a long time and not find a more appropriate building material than a straw bale for our area because we need a lot of insulation and it's uh, locally available and locally manufactured with readily available equipment that people have. So I think you could it, it's a solution that probably w won't wear out. Uh, here's an example of a, a bunch of different um, natural building methods in one wall. You see, um, you see stone on the bottom here. You see some earth plaster and cob and some rammed earth. And at the top, you might see also a little bit of uh, light straw clay. This is what a, and a lot of times you think when you build with natural materials, you end up looking, having this kind of wavy gravy look. But you can uh, get very straight finished walls if you like. It's just, it's more a matter of the person's preference who's building. And this is a uh, this is a rammed earth block wall, a ram excuse me, a monolithic rammed earth wall. Uh, and here's more of the wavy gravy look. Uh, this is a cob uh, wall. And here's uh, here's uh, some uh, cordwood masonry, which is just basically stacking up logs like you would stone. And you can, okay. And here's an earth bag building where you have. Uh, it's another technique of building with, uh, with rammed earth, but instead of having to build forms, you use um, these grain bags uh, filled with earth. And uh, this is a, uh, I, I recommend this book, Eco Nest. It's by a, a friend of mine, Robert Laporte. He used to live in Fairfield, now lives in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Him and his uh, architect wife, Paula Laporte. And they, they build the most beautiful buildings of natural materials that I've ever seen. And they use a, a technique called, uh, which involves timber frame and what's called light straw clay, which I'll talk maybe a little bit more about later. But just to want to give you a little overview. And you can see, you know, you can have very finely finished um, walls. You know, they, they don't have to be, um, this is something like you might see in any fine glossy magazine at the checkout counter at the, at the supermarket. So a little bit about the history of straw bale. And you might think that this is like a recent hippie invention, but actually it was developed in the, about the same time mechanical balers started to be in, uh, built in the mid-18 to late 1800s. And there are buildings that still exist today in Nebraska from the 1900s. Uh, the earliest straw bale buildings, I think about 1865, 1870. There was a, <coughs> in the, and then there, there was um, some building construction in different parts of the country that was done up until like maybe the 30s and 40s, and then it kind of fell out of favor. And in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, it was kind of rediscovered and redeveloped in the Southwest. Some of the, some of the leaders in that renaissance are a guy named Matt, Matt Smearman, who um, started a, a publication called Out on Bale, which is still one of the best publications for straw bale and natural building plasters and things like that. It also developed into a sort of workshop owner-builder um, 
um, method of building where you know it, it, it lends itself to a, like a barn raising kind of affair. So you have a lot of your friends come over and in a few hours you can put all the walls up for a house. And uh, so that's, that's continues today to kind of be a lot of the way that, that, that uh, non-commercial straw bale buildings are built. And there's a, a, a couple, uh, the Steens, who wrote a book called The Straw Bale House Book um, back in the 1990s that uh, inspired a lot of people. And in, 2000, uh, in the 2000s, you, you start to see straw bales showing up just about everywhere. There are thousands of straw bale buildings, for example, that are built in China with inspiration from the Renaissance in the American Southwest. There are actually building codes in uh, Tucson, Arizona, Austin, Boulder, and California. Uh, you can actually get copies of the building codes here uh, on, at this website. Um, that, so it's actually part of the building code. So you can build with you know, brick or, st you know, or, or standard uh, st stick frame construction at, through these building codes, and you can build a straw bale. Um, there's been very large uh, uh, commercial buildings, the Santa Clarita Transit Building, um, uh, the whole project's a $20 million project, 50,000 square feet of straw bale construction. Uh, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you a little bit about that. And then there's a lot of international projects happening too. <coughs> Back to the history again. This is what some of the early straw bale buildings look like, uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea. You see this very conventional looking in a way, you wouldn't know it was straw bale. I've, I've uh, had friends who've gone to Nebraska and seen some of the early straw bale homes. There's one that's actually covered with Sears vinyl siding now, you know, so it looks just like a regular, you know, house in a way. Uh, and uh, this is one that was built in France in 1921. Um, there's basically two different techniques for building with straw. One in which the bales actually support the load of the roof and are the structural component of the building. Is they're, they're actually structural. And then the other method is where there's a, there's a, a separate frame usually of wood or steel, uh, and the straw bale is just a cellulose kind of insulation. It's just an infill insulation. And really when, you know, a lot of people that, well, I'll talk about mist and straw bale in just a second here. And so here's an, here's an overall look at how a straw bale house might go together. This particular drawing is for a load-bearing uh, straw bale house where the, where the um, bales actually hold the roof up and, and form the structure of the building. You can see you can cut door and window openings in, um, this uses conventional looking trusses, you know, very conventional looking building except that the wall, the insulation and the structural material are made out of straw bale. And so one way to think about straw bale is really just another kind of cellulose insulation. But it happens to have the property also that you can use it as a, um, as a structural member. Um, this has actually been studied to a fairly large extent, um, you know, in, in, in university engineering testing labs and there's data out enough so that um, building codes could be developed for it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this is, um, <coughs> this is a, uh, a school in North Dakota to give you an idea how much these buildings, some of these buildings, when you hire somebody to build them, might cost. Um, and this is a, this is a, uh, a load-bearing straw bale. The roof is actually held up by these walls. Uh, you see quite a nicely finished building. Uh, it costs about 250,000 square feet, $250,000. So you know, $120, $130 a square foot. I don't know how much co construction costs are up here, but in my area, that's, you know, $100 to $150 a square foot is the normal construction cost, depending on what kind of finishes you have. And this building has quite nice finishes. It's got solar electric on top. It's got LED lighting, high, high efficiency lighting. It's got good day lighting. Uh, a lot of, you know, you know this, this building wouldn't maybe look out of place on uh, a lot of college campuses or something like that. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths of straw bale building, and you're starting to see these kind of, um, you know, this interest in natural building show up everywhere. And this is a, this is from a show that's on public television uh, called Building Green. Well, so why don't we all use them? Well, most people envision a straw bale wall burning or rotting or being blown down by the big bad wolf. But installed properly, this wall will burn less easily than a regular wall. The straw will rot no more easily than regular wood, and there is no big bad wolf that is blowing this house down. All of that, and it can lighten the load on our planet and our pocketbooks. It's the one material you can get directly from farmers, and it's said that they grow enough straw to meet all of our residential building needs. 
We're going to go in depth in future episodes of Building Green about straw bale building. But just know for now, it is one of the most perfect natural building materials you can use. For in-depth information on today's show and to learn more about all aspects of green building, join us on our website at buildinggreentv.com. That's buildinggreentv as in television.com. There's just, just to give you an idea that this is something that's, uh, that's out in the general public now, <clears throat> and a couple of design considerations for straw bale and a lot of natural building materials in general. Um, there's a saying that if you provide this uh, straw bale house with good boots and a good hat, it'll last forever, meaning a wide <coughs> roof to protect the walls from, um, from moisture, and uh, uh, a good boots, meaning um, it's up, the bales start a little bit off the ground, like maybe six inches to a foot off the ground, so the foundation sits up maybe on a little bit of a plinth. Um, and then that solves a lot of, that, that solves a lot of design, um, design problems right up front. Some of the myths that were mentioned earlier about fire, a lot of people think, oh, a straw bale house would burn down very easily. Actually, straw bale's quite dense and it's quite hard, it's, it's like burning a, fi a phone book. It's very difficult to burn. Um, there was a straw bale house in Fairfield, where I live in Fairfield, there's probably about 25 straw bale houses that have been built in the last 15 years. And um, there was a fire in one, and the fire, I talked to the fire chief, and he, he swears that that house would have burnt down completely if it wasn't made out of straw bale. They had a, 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 some problem when the owners were away, and it, mo and, it, and it smoldered in the walls for a couple of days before they got back. Uh, insects and vermin is another myth. A lot of people think, well, you know, straw bale walls will just naturally be full of, uh, of mice and other kind of in and insects and things. But really, straw is just cellulose insulation. So there's the same kind of considerations for mice and vermin in a straw bale wall as there is for any other wall. So if you have a good coating on the outside, a good plaster, then um, that's really not an issue. And it's, and it's not any different than the issues you'd have in any other kind of building. In fact, probably less, because it's very difficult for them to burrow through it because it's dense. Moisture issues, a lot of, um, th this, this, this is a concern, but with any cellulose insulation, uh, in any wall, moisture is a concern. You have to worry about how the vapor is going to flow through the wall. You have to worry about what's going to happen while the, while the wall, wall is being constructed and how you're going to keep the bales dry while the wall is being constructed. Um, but it's really not a lot different once the construction's over than any other kind of moisture problems. In fact, straw bale is much, um, much more forgiving of moisture. When I was building my house, it rained and dried out and rained and dried out. And if I had a conventional insulation that it got wet just once, it probably would be all over for it. Um, the three pig story, everybody's heard, you know, they, they live in a straw bale house, you hear that a lot. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've built three straw bale houses starting in 1975. And one thing I should mention, I'm not a professional builder. Uh, I, I'm a developer and I've built a, a developing an eco-village project, but I work with other builders. Um, I've built a lot of my own houses, but I don't build straw bale houses for other people. Um, a lot of people think straw bale is inexpensive, and it can be. Uh, the bales themselves, I think the ba all the bales for my home were about $600, but bales are only a small, uh, walls are only a small fraction of the cost of a house, conventional house, maybe five, 10% of the cost of the house is in the walls. So even if the walls are very inexpensive, finishing off a house to most people's taste is still very expensive. And because straw bale is a building, if you're going to have somebody else build it for you, straw bale is a material that many people are not very familiar with, then uh, it can actually cost more because a builder will build in a premium because he's never worked with the material before. So um, I, I, uh, that said, you can build very inexpensive straw bale buildings, and I'll show you some. Um, Many of the people here probably wouldn't want to live in them, but uh, you can build very inexpensive straw bale buildings. The idea that straw bale is energy efficient. Well, that's true, but again, like any other construction, it also depends on the tightness of the envelope, uh, infiltration. The, we'll talk a little bit, there's a little bit of controversy about exactly how much R value, or are people familiar with that term, R value? Um, resistance to the flow of uh, energy, of uh, heat. Um, so they can be very en energy efficient, but they're not, automatically energy efficient. Um, a lot of people think this is a funky owner builder kind of thing only, and I'll show you some really, you know, there are, there are whole subdivisions of multi-million dollar straw bale homes in, in the Southwest, so it doesn't have to be that way. Another idea, another idea that's gone the wayside is that you need chicken wire over the bale, you need to coat the bales with chicken wire and then put plaster on them. Everybody's pretty much agrees that chicken wire is not a good idea anymore, you don't need it and that you can't get insurance or a mortgage with straw bale homes, and many straw bale homes have insurance and mortgages, and it's not really, my insurance company never really asked me 
about it. You know, they've come out and seen my house many times, and um, it's 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 not been the, my my wood stove was a much bigger issue with my insurance company than the straw bale part of it was. Um, and here's you know here's this kind of idea that you know maybe we could start creating uh, straw bale here in the Midwest. So I want to talk a little bit about building systems and techniques, uh, foundations. This idea of load bearing versus infill. Um, Bale placement, <coughs> that's uh, a straw bale, you know, is, I was going to bring one with me, but I didn't, it's kind of, they're kind of, um, not, they're, they're not uh, small. <laughs> I mean, they're small, but they're not tiny. Um, so say this is a straw bale, you could build with it either this way or this way. And a straw bale is typically 32 to 36 inches long, um, 15 inches tall, and 19 inches wide. And so if you build with it this way, then you've got 19 inches of straw insulation. If you build it with it this way, you have 15. But it turns out that the, um, that the straw fibers are aligned this way, and air can more easily blow through them than if they're aligned this way. And the tests have shown that the R value is about the same, whether it's this way or this way. And there are different builders who prefer one method over the other. And there are advantages to both ways. More a matter of personal style. And window and door openings. Um, the last straw bale building we built, we plastered the whole thing completely, and then we cut the window and door openings out with a chainsaw afterwards. Uh, and it was very simple. It was very easy. We could just cut the door and window openings wherever we wanted. Um, this shows you a little bit. This is on a, on a wall rather than a, um, rather than a build, uh, rather than a building. But you can see how high the bales start off the ground. And you can see uh, these bales are on their side this way. You can see the, the strings. And uh, you can see they're putting, they're gonna, they're getting ready to put a good hat on this wall, and it la will last quite a long time. This is at the Black Range Lodge. When you saw the windows out, yeah. didn't you end up with some loose straw? Uh, yeah, but when, once you put the plaster on, uh, whether the whether the strings are, are get cut or not, it doesn't really matter so much after that. It stays pretty compact. Yeah. yeah, it does. And then we had a we had a go, you know, I will I'll talk a little bit more about that, but. The engineering stu studies that have been done uh, pretty much show that um, a plastered wall is far, far greater than a non-plastered wall because it's a composite. You know, you've got this, this material that's um, fibrous and not very kind of strong on its own, and you've got this plaster that's not that strong on its own, but you put the two of them together, the plaster with the fibers in it, most of the weight of the building is actually held in the plaster on the outside of the bale, supported on the plaster on the outside of the bale. So um, um, the... the uh, but, but it, it, it worked just fine. I was a little bit worried about it, but it worked just fine. Yeah. Are those bales then staggered like you would a brick? Yes, okay. yes, yeah. You, wanna, um, you don't want to have the, um, the joints line up, so uh, don't have them here, but it, you know, you'd have two, two bales like this, and the one on top would go in between like that. And uh, you just stack them up just like bricks. Now is that a concrete foundation there, and then do you have free bar, or is it directly on top of Well, there's the, the, typically they'll be pinned with rebar. Um, and th again, that's something that's changing. The, the kind of state of the art in, uh, in straw bale building is not to pin them anymore, is to use um, um, columns uh, every so often. And uh, typically, uh, um, a, uh, the building codes for straw bale will, with standard size bales, will allow a bale, a wall about 10 feet tall. Um, they have a certain ratio of width to height and about 30 feet long without supports. But if you put supports about every eight or 10 feet, you really don't need the pinning. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about that. But, but typically there'll be some, some rebar that'll be sticking out of the bottom there. And that's what it looks like when it's finished. So you can see, and then plastered. It's typically, then there's a straw bale home behind it. That's also a straw bale home. And um, <coughs> our local straw bale expert is a guy named Brad Young, and he's actually got a machine for applying the plaster. And he's a young Iowa, you know, 20 something, maybe he's 30 now. And he spent five years uh, going around with the best, uh, interning with the best natural builders all through the Southwest. And um, he ended up in Fairfield. And uh, he, this, is, this doesn't actually exist, but this is kind of his future vision dream for a more, um, a more automated, a more industrial kind of straw bale building where you might get these panels from a factory that are pre-made and they come in on a truck and you, uh, you, you just tilt the panels up and put a, a, a bond beam across the top and, and then spray on a plaster with a machine. And you might be able to build these kind of buildings quite quickly and inexpensively. Um, so you've got your straw bale built walls up. 
The next thing you need to do is uh, plaster. And, and, and Iowa has some of the best uh, clays for making plasters that you'll find anywhere in the world. And a plaster is typically a mix of earth, sand, lime, and cement, oh, and, and, and an option of cement. There's a bit of controversy about the use of cement in straw bale construction. One thing is that it takes a lot of energy to create cement, and a lot, a lot of the um, go, um, uh, CO2 production in the, in the world is, is related to the production of cement. Um, you know, something like 10 or 20 percent of it is related to the production of cement. Uh, and um, it also is not, it, it, it doesn't have very good characteristics when you put it right on a straw bale. Uh, I, I've seen many cement plastered straw bale houses that seem to work just fine. Uh, but most people tend to go with earth, sand, and lime, with lime on the final coat to provide a little bit more durability. Um, the way you develop a plaster with the material you have on hand, you, you dig up some clay on site, um, and then um, you start testing. You, you, you can put it in a, um, take some of the clay and put it in a jar with water and shake it up, and it'll settle out. And the clay, the heavy materials will settle out on the bottom, and the finer materials and clay will be on the top, and you can actually just measure with a ruler what percentage of clay that you have. And then you'll add sand, depending on that. that. It's too much to get into in a short talk on how it all works, but just to give you a rough idea. And then you, and then you put up a bunch of sample batches. So you'll, you'll make little batches of, of uh, plaster, maybe 10 of them with different amounts of sand, let them dry for a couple days and see how they crack. And the, the trade-off is if you put um, not enough sand in, it'll shrink and crack. If you put too much sand in, it won't be sticky enough to stick to the bale. So you want the, the perfect one in between. So and you have to kind of test that with each, you know, um, uh, site. And then there are pigments and coloring, iron oxide pigments that you can add for red colors and lots of other different colors that you can, uh, natural materials that you can use for coloring. Where does clay come from? Y usually right at the, when you dig the foundation hole. Um, the machine that uh, Brad Young I mentioned earlier uh, has for, for you know, applying plaster really speeds up the process. It's quite sensitive to even small rocks in the, in the, in the clay mix. So you have to screen it through a, through a, uh, through a, um, a screen. And we found a brick company in Iowa that, that um, um, produces a lot of clay for making bricks. And they screen it really fine. And they sell it pretty cheap. So a few times when we're using that machine, we've actually bought the clay from the brick company. Um, and you can see that you know plastering is, again, one of these things that, that, that lends itself well to workshops and having a lot of people over and kind of having fun and getting muddy and wet. And, um, and this is, you know, making some of those test batches and, and applying plaster to uh, one of the first straw bale buildings I built. Talk a little bit about energy performance. Um, in 1996, uh, Oak Ridge National Labs did these, what, what are called hot box tests on straw bale walls. And they found that a 19 inch wall had an R value of 27.5 or 1.45 per inch. Well, if you're familiar with other insulating materials, you'll know that that's not uh, very much. You know, um, uh, uh, s fiberglass insulation is about three per inch, I think. Uh, um, uh, styrofoam is about four and a half per inch, something like that. So, um, so a lot of people were really disappointed with that because a lot of people were thinking, well, straw bale is R50, R60. You know, it's like three per inch because it's very si similar to, uh, you think it'd be very similar to fiberglass. And then some other studies were done in 2003 at the University of Arizona. And they found that a 19-inch wall had up to an R57, which would be a 2.4 to 3, which is what a lot more people uh, expected. And it depends, again, on the direction of the straw. We talked about that. The moisture level of the straw and the density of the bale. If that bale's really packed, it, it doesn't have as much of an insulating value. Um, people also take uh, straw and compress it. If you compress straw under a lot of heat and, pre a lot of heat and pressure, the lignin in the straw will, will bind it to itself. And you can make building panels out of just fused straw, and, but those don't have very much insulating value at all because they're so dense. Um, and then these, you have to be careful with these kind of in insulation uh, R-value numbers because it's not considering the whole wall system. This is just kind of the bale um, and, and how much infiltration you have in that wall. And so, you know, you might say I've got an R57 wall, but if it's not sealed very well and a, a lot of the other kind of things you do in con conventional kind of construction, and, and a, a big place is, you know, you, you'll have a, a wood, wooden roof, some kind of wooden frame or steel frame for a roof. And where the bale meets that, and where the bale meets any other kind of hard surface, is a bit of a challenge to seal. Because you seal it with clay, the clay shrinks a little bit. So 
you have to go back and, um, and oftentimes go back and do some, um, uh, uh, you know, cases of caulking later. Um, so you want to, that, that's a, a, something that you really have to think about for energy performance in a straw bale building. So now I'm going to show you a few examples. Uh, I've built three straw bale buildings uh, myself in the last uh, 15 years, and I've been involved as a consultant or as part of the construction team on about 15 or 20 others. I'm going to show you that large project in California we talked about, I talked about earlier, a few Fairfield projects, uh, some projects at Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, in, uh, where, where there's um, one of the larger concentrations of straw bale buildings in one spot. And one of the most beautiful natural buildings I've, uh, I've seen, straw bale buildings in Missouri, um, some friends of mine, David and Alice Schaefer. This is my first straw bale building. Um, and uh, you can see it has a quite a complex roof. I, I originally built this, um, intended to make it a load-bearing straw bale, but the roof was far too heavy for that. Um, you have to have very simple roof lines for, uh, for um, load-bearing straw bale. And then this is, uh, that was built in uh, 1992. This was built in about five or six years ago, and just this, this in the past year we added this sunroom on, uh, which is not straw bale. Um, a couple of things about the house, it has a very large um, solar hot air collector, but a very simple one here. It has rain catchment, so all of our water is supplied from rain catchment, and it's completely powered by solar and wind power. How big is your house? Uh, it's pretty small. It's only about 500 square feet in a living space and then some basement space. Um, it's, it's small. Um, so passive, uh, so here's passive solar design with high performance thermotech windows. I, I, I searched around and bought the absolute best windows I could buy. I was developing Abundance Eco Village at the time and we used this to test out a lot of the systems that we eventually used at Abundance Eco Village. Um, it's got a very simple uh, active uh, hot air system uh, with a PV powered direct fan. So whenever the sun comes out and I want heat in the house, um, that's this thing right here. Um, the sun also hits a little solar panel that runs a little fan and circulates air through the, through, there's a space between that uh, glazing material and the roof and then circulates it back into the house. And on a zero degree day, I can bring 120 degree air into the house. So really it's just designed to heat the house on sunny days in the wintertime. It's not desi designed to provide all the heat to the house. And if I had windows that big in the house, it would grossly overheat in the daytime and it would really cool off a lot at night. So I have just a modest amount of windows and then I have this big solar thermal collector that I can completely disconnect. It's got about R60 uh, between it and the building and it also has um, radiant heat barriers so that I can pretty much completely isolate it in the summertime, but in the wintertime I can, I can dump quite a lot of heat in the house if I like. Um, I've, got a, I've got a solar uh, domestic hot water system with PV direct pumps. And uh, this, this idea I got from a woman named Anna Edie. She has a book called Soul Viva. I highly recommend you to take a look at her design work. Um, the solar hot water, I had some old, you might not be familiar with solar hot water panels, but they're basically uh, a box, a thin box with a glass cover that sun shines through, it heats up and uh, heats up a fluid in there that you can pump and put, in, put the heat into a tank in your basement. Uh, I had some solar panels that had the covers broken on them and I put the cores underneath this uh, glazing material and um, then I again have a sol PV direct pump, so I have a solar electric panel that whenever the sun comes out it just starts those pumps running. And uh, that works really well. It doesn't take a lot of controls. It, 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 I completely shut off the backup. I have propane for backup. For 10 months of the year, it provides us with all of our hot water. And for the other um, uh, two or three months, it provides most of it, um, some of it every day. You know, some, some weeks, you know, we, we use uh, our propane. Um, it's got earth tubes for cooling, which are uh, basically for, um, I guess I'll talk about those a little bit later. Has rain catchment. We collect water off the, off the roof, a uh, very simple tank. We, we walled off about a third of the basement of the house with a concrete wall. Um, we, th and, that's, and that's about a 10,000 gallon tank. We found that's what you need for a, for a family of four. You need somewhere between an eight and uh, 10,000 gallon tank to go through those, you know, sometime in the, if you have dry years and you have several months with no rain. Uh, we had a 1,000 gallon tank in the past and, and we would run short on water once in a great, great while. Um, but we always have enough water with this larger tank. Um, we have a vermicomposting toilet, which is, we use earthworms for, for, the, for, the, for composting, and it's actually, a, um, it's actually a flush composting toilet. So it looks, it looks like a regular toilet, but it flushes into a box of worms. Solar and wind electric, really good daylighting, and uh, a wood stove for uh, backup heat. We don't have any other kind of backup uh, 
heating system but the wood stove. Use propane for cooking and for backup on our hot water. Um, this is the house under construction, and you can see the frame here. Again, this is a, uh, not a load-bearing building. This is a uh, infill. And here's the bales up, and uh, uh, we had a crew there helping us plaster, and there's what it looked like with uh, sort of one of the final coats of plaster on it. Here's what it looks like on the inside, and you can see it's got very good daylighting. Um, uh, another thing that we did, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, I guess I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But we, um, we used almost all locally milled lumber uh, for the construction of the, of, the, of the project. We found somebody who had a diesel powered sawmill, we made up some biodiesel, and we bought some, uh, some logs and had, saw, had all the lumber sawed up from it locally. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and here's you know, some of the energy performance. We've got 14 inches of cellulose insulation with radiant barriers in the ceiling. 19-inch uh, straw bale walls, they're, they're laid this way. Uh, and we have four inches of styrofoam in the basement, about R20, that's on the outside exterior of the basement. We have that big water tank there also that acts as thermal mass. Um, talked about daylighting a little bit. We've got this large clerestory window, uh, which provides really great daylight. Even on a very cloudy day, you're not tempted to turn the lights on. Uh, we're able to light. Uh, <laughs> We're able to light the, the, the space at night with 21 watts of in, indirect compact fluorescent lighting, so it doesn't take very much extra light. Uh, earth tubes for cooling, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. There are 400 foot long tubes that um, when, I, when, when I first uh, was uh, considering this, I thought we were gonna have to dig these big trenches out in the field. And we have a consultant, his name is Larry Larson, who, who, who consults on all the earth tube systems in uh, Fairfield. And he came by and said, well, no, just dig your foundation a little bit wider. So we just dug the foundation a little bit wider and wrapped the tubes around that. And uh, so it was very inexpensive to install. Um, and six feet deep in the ground, the earth temperature is always about 55 degrees. So when it's 100 degrees outside, I can bring air in through these tubes with a little tiny fan, about a 20 watt fan. And when it comes into the house from a 100 degree day, it's about 70 degrees. And it's been dehumidified uh, to, a, to a fairly large extent. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot involved in how the earth tubes are placed and how the drainage works so you don't get mold problems and mo moisture problems. And I highly recommend that you work with somebody like Larry Larson who's put in a number of these systems. Um, it also provides tempering in the winter because if the temperature outside is, you know, 20 below zero, uh, 55 is a lot warmer than that. So you might get 40 degree air into the house. So it's, it's, it's preheated a little bit. In the, Dead of the winter, you're much better off with an air-to-air -air heat exchanger than you are with the earth tube system. Um, and it's a 20-watt fan versus a 1,500-watt compressor for, for conventional air conditioning. And, another, and there's uh, one of the students who was helping us put it in. You can see the tubes there. Another thing that uh, makes this work is that the house is pretty well insulated. You don't get the same high, uh, you don't, you, this wouldn't work in a very poorly insulated house because it's not you know, a high um, uh, amount of chilling like you could get from a compressor. Uh, the next building I'm going to show you is a, um, is a building that we built uh, to house our summer uh, education program I call Big Green Summer. It's a 10-week intensive in permaculture in the design of sustainable systems. So it's uh, renewable energy, wind and solar, uh, collecting rainwater, uh, natural building, um, organic agriculture local economy issues, all those kinds of things. And the unique feature about it is students live what they learn. So they live in solar power buildings made of local natural materials. And so um, we also teach permaculture design courses and permaculture, how many people are familiar with that word? Permaculture, a few people. Um, it's basically, a lot of people think it's a funny kind of organic agriculture, but it's basically the integration of energy and housing and food production and livelihood, not at your home, but also not just at your home, but in your neighborhood and in your whole community and then maybe in your broader region. So it's about you know, sort of integrated design, design with nature, um, and uh, there's a, it's taught in these two-week intensive uh, 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 design intensives. And there's about, it's a very interdisciplinary field. We have about 20 or 30 instructors who come in and help us teach the course. And so this is, uh, so <coughs> this was, we wanted to build a shop, lab, and cl classroom for our programs. And uh, we use locally milled lumber and these uh, metal, metal brackets to put the frame up. We were able to build these on the ground and just tip them up with a tractor, sort of. And uh, again, we use locally milled lumber. And uh, I want to tell you a tale of two two by fours. Um, this is, a, uh, if you go to the lumber yard and you buy a two by four, 
most of those come from the Pacific Northwest. And is anybody here from the Pacific Northwest? Do you have any friends up there? You know they're not that happy that we're cutting down all their forests. Iowa can grow some of the best hardwood forests in the world, but there's not so much a market for it. Um, if I buy a two by four at the lumber yard, it costs me about a dollar a board foot. This cost me 50 cents a board foot. And uh, of that 50 cents, um, five cents goes to the landowner who grew the timber. 20 cents goes to the crew who cut it down and took it to the sawmill. And then 25 cents goes to the guy who made it into a two by four. All of the money goes into the pockets of people in my county. That's the kind of um, uh, lesson we like to teach our students. So we try to build with local, lo locally milled lumber as much as we can. Did you dry the lumber at all? Sometimes we do, sometimes we build with green lumber. The first house at the Eco Village I'll show you was built with a you know, very conventional looking 3,600 square foot you know, high end house was built with all green lumber. And it's six years old now and it's, uh, w it looks pretty good. Um, so, and then here's, here, here's some of the details. Here's the, here's the pile of bales. And it's nice to build with a, uh, with a um, uh, post and beam system like this because you can put the bales out of the rain right away. You have the roof up right away. That's a really big advantage. Um, then uh, we had a, a permaculture course at the time and we had about 25 students and we put all the bales up in the walls in four hours uh, under the direction of this guy, Brad Young, who's our local bale expert. And you can see him uh, demonstrating the machine application of earth plasters. So you can do a whole building like this in a day or so. And this is the hand application of earth plasters, which might take months and months to plaster a building like this. The, you know, everything's, oh wow, you know, the straw bale is so quick and so cheap. You know, it's a few hundred dollars worth of bales and they go up in four or five hours, but then it takes you years or maybe never to finish the rest of the house. <laughs> if you've ever been involved in, how many people have been involved in owner builder projects? Yeah, how many people have finished them? Oh, wow, yeah, <laughs> that's great, that's great. And you can see here's Brad, uh, you know, teaching a little lesson on earth plasters. Um, and here's some of the students placing the bales in the walls. And you can see these, um, these, um, these uh, box columns that were put around the, um, around the um, um, beams that actually hold the building up so that they're exactly the width of the bale and everything fits in there and then you don't have to pin it. You don't have to worry about, uh, about a lot of things if you do it that way. Here's our vermicomposting toilet. You can see our, our building here. And uh, when we flush the toilet, it comes down into here and this box is full of compost worms. And they just chunk the material down. And then because it's only the toilet, it's a very small amount of liquid material and it's a very small constructed wetland that handles the liquid that comes out of that. Any questions? No, okay. Uh, a little bit about rainwater harvesting. You can see the roof here, it comes down here to this tank. This tank provides, we'd, we'd like to pick this tank up about six feet and then we can gravity feed water to the whole property. Um, managing water with very little energy is far more complex than hooking up solar and wind power. <laughs> but um, this uh, comes down here and then we can gravity feed to this water tank. This is a greenhouse and we can hook a hose up to this and get some pressure out of that. Uh, and that's just, you know, so you can see a little bit of a simple rainwater harvesting system. How often do you have to take the worms out of your... Um, the one that we, I built for my house is five years old and I still haven't had to empty it yet. And w when you look in it, I should have showed a picture inside. It, uh, the one for my house is about three feet square, three feet deep. Um, what you see, in the, ol the only thing you see in it is what you flush that day. The rest of it is just like rich black dirt. And if anybody's ever had any experience with some of the small commercial composting toilets, they don't really work very well. Um, and this works extremely well. And it's very simple and inexpensive. Um, it's nothing that you'll ever get approved in a, if you need code approval, so don't even try. It's, you know, it's just something that you, you might do on your own. Enough. To take that compost out of there and use it in your uh, I, I, would, I would only use it on like timber crops. I wouldn't use it on any food related crops. Although, you know, the er, vermicomposting is a, is a very uh, good method for getting rid of pathogens. And again, all you see in there is what you flush that day. The, the new system that we built for, the, for our classroom and shop building is a two uh, chamber system. So that one side gets full, we can flip it to the other side and then we can let that sit with the worms for another year before we take it out. But it's, it's just amazing, to, you look in there and there's like a billion worms and they, they look really happy and then they're, all you see again is what you flushed in that day and everything else is just, looks like the richest, blackest compost you could imagine. They're, they're okay, I mean, they, 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 yeah, I put, I, we insulate it and we insulate the cover and they seem to make it through the winter fine so far. Um, and again, you know, other, you know, rainwater collection doesn't always have to be tanks on your roof. This is another rainwater collection system and uh, it actually makes food, this, this lotus, almost every part's edible of the lotus and it's beautiful. This is our lotus pond for swimming. 
And then this is a, and we're, we're, we're putting, we're in the process right now, we've got solar panels on the roof and we're in the process of, of putting on a greenhouse on the south side of this building now. And this was one of our first courses there. Some students had built a wind generator. This is um, 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 the mayor of Des Moines who came by and he's, he was, uh, took one of our permaculture courses. And then these are some of the energy systems that power our property there. There's some solar hot water on another building here. Uh, you can see the, this is the uh, straw bale barn, uh, some solar electric and some wind. So I'll just uh, go through a few of these projects really quickly. There's, this is on the campus at the university. This is a straw bale building. It's quite a large building. I think probably around 3,500, uh, 4,000 square feet. Um, there's two buildings that almost look exactly alike, straw bale. Um, this is a commercial contractor built straw bale building in Washington, Iowa. Um, again, you, very conventional looking, except that you, know, you could sort of tell this is a passive solar building. Um, but this was built by um, uh, Mid-America Housing uh, out of Cedar, uh, Cedar Rapids. And they, they build uh, oh, 30 or 40 homes every year, low income housing, and they operate about six or 700 um, units of rental housing. And they just got interested in this from an environmental perspective and, and built this um, very conventional straw bale. This is one that was, um, uh, somebody had a metal barn and they added onto it with straw bale. That's in near Iowa City. This is, the, this is a straw bale house. And again, this is probably the most beautiful straw bale house I've seen, faced with stone. They were building this house and a neighbor of theirs was, uh, there was an Amish crew putting a stone face on the house. And they talked with them and, and, and they said, well, they, we could put stone, stone facing on your straw bale house too. And it was about the same price as vinyl siding. And uh, it's really a beautiful building. I, I, sorry I don't have more pictures of it. This is Dancing Rabbit Eco Village. Uh, how many people have heard of Dancing Rabbit? It's a group of, you know, it's again, again one of these things to how do you get, you know, y um, young people to come and kind of re energize rural America? Well, this is in rural uh, Missouri. And it's a bunch of 20 something year old kids from, the Stan uh, from Stanford and Berkeley who um, wanted to build an eco village for 500,000 people. And they just, one of them had roots back here and they discovered you could buy land here for like two or $300 an acre. And they bought a big piece of land and now they've got about 40 or 50 people there. Um, this was an architect designed, Berkeley architect designed uh, straw bale home. Um, and you can see the insides very nicely, finely finished. They really got it down on their earth plaster. This is a, um, a special kind of uh, high efficiency wood burning appliance called a rocket stove that you can build quite inexpensively. And the chimney goes under this bench so your butt's heated on the bench in the wintertime. It's kind of nice. And, uh, and then you know there's a, th there's a, another ex experiment in natural building there, much much more, much different. Again, simple simple buildings. This is something that some students built on a weekend uh, uh, in, in a few hours, just for a tool shed. Um, this was a, an attempt to build an emergency shelter at a conference that was hel held in Fairfield. You know what would you do if you you just had straw bales and there was a, um, a big big natural disaster? What might, might you do? Um, this is, uh, again, you know, you can see some of the beauty of straw bale. This is a, a dining hall at a, the Presentation re Retreat Center in Los Gatos, California. There's the whole building there. One of the unique features here is they used uh, solar hot water panels to shade their windows, which I thought was a really clever idea. Uh, the Clayton Lake Visitor Center in Clayton, New Mexico. And you can see the straw bale under construction. Again, very conventional looking when, it, when its uh, plaster is done. This is this uh, Santa Clarita transit building, uh, very large complex of straw bale buildings in California. Uh, interesting thing here, you see, what's this guy, can anybody see what this guy's doing? Like yeah, he's, he's, he's trimming the wall with a weed eater. It's a, it's a, it's a common tool that's used in straw bale construction. Um, other kind of natural building projects, if you want to get your feet wet with this, is to build a clay oven for a baking bread. You can do that in a, in a weekend or two. Uh, port earth floors, we don't have time to talk about that, but you can actually make very durable floors that look like, have the kind of look and feel of polished leather with adobe. Um, if you want to access those building codes, uh, you can read the actual building codes are available to download here on this uh, Developmental Center for Appropriate, whoops, <laughs> Developmental Center for Appropriate Technology run by David Eisenberg, who's one of the authors of the original straw bale buildings. It's out of uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona. Um, and if you want to know more about the technical details and the uh, uh, engineering, design, engineering test work that's been done on straw bale, I recommend these books by Bruce King. Uh, he's a licensed professional engineer, Building with Earth and Straw, and the Design of Straw Bale Buildings. This is a new book I haven't seen, uh, but I, I recommend it without reading, which is a little dangerous, but um, 
it's, uh, he's, uh, I, I really trust his work. Um, there's a lot of, there's periodicals, lots of books, videos, lots of web resources. Iowa Regional Personnel, I'll talk a little bit about that. This, this magazine called The Last Straw is a great one. You can get all the back issues on a, on a little CD for a fairly inexpensive price. And this is, uh, I, I want to give a lot of thanks to our local straw bale expert, Brad Young. This is Brad here. And uh, he's, he's been, a, you know, if you wanted to do a, a straw bale home, you could contact him and he could organize a workshop for you and consult with you. Um, I'll say a couple of things about, uh, just about done here. Uh, a couple of things about some of the other work that I do. Um, I'm one of the founding faculty members in the four-year program in sustainable living at Marish University of Management. This is the design for our new building, which uh, we hope to break ground on in the next few months. Um, some of the projects our students uh, worked on in the last year, this is a wind generator that they built from scratch. Actually learned how to machine the components and learned how to weld and put up towers and things. Built a biodiesel uh, processor that's capable of producing 500 to 1,000 gallons of biodiesel a day. A little solar power, solar uh, electric vehicle, which is basically a golf cart with solar panels on it. Uh, a commercial sized solar oven, and we also went and lobbied for a clean energy economy at the State House. Um, I'm the de developer, one of the developers, original developers of Abundance Eco Village, um, which is a completely off grid home um, um, subdivision. All conventional construction, no straw bale homes here yet, although there is a, 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 faz uh, a, a home that's built of uh, concrete and hemp blocks. Um, all off the grid, all rainwater collection. Uh, there's, uh, it's been going slowly uh, for about six years now. The first six years there's been six houses, but right now there's seven houses under construction and it's probably gonna be built out in the rest of the year because some big developers in town have gotten interested in building spec homes there and it's going very well for them, so. Um, then I talked a little bit earlier about these uh, summer education programs and I've got some literature here and we have a lot of, uh, th these are supported by the um, Grinnell College, Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation. We have a lot of scholarships for these so apply early if you're interested and um, ab about two thirds of our students last summer got full scholarships for the program. Uh, so I'll, s I'll just close and talk about, you know, this kind of local global context, um, you know, a lot of people have heard about, uh, familiar with the local foods movement and all the economic and health benefits of that. And I think, you know, a lot of that, those same kind of ideas can be, be applied to how we build. And we can create, and how we, how we provision ourselves with energy and water also. And we can create wealth and opportunity on, in our communities by how we build and how we provision ourselves with energy, food, and water. We can impoverish ourselves with the way we do that. So a uh, little quote from Buckminster Fuller, we are charged with designing the future, not being victims of it. Thank you very much. And I'll Can I take questions for about five minutes and then we'll sure. close and people have Okay. So, yeah. Uh, the rest of your wastewater from your uh, wash machine, do you have a gray water system? Here? Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you deal with the electrical inside? That's a good question. There's lots of different ways. Um, you, can, you can use a weed whacker and cut little channels in, and then, or you can, you know, depending on how you lay the bales, you can tuck the tuck the wires in between a course of bales and plaster over them. Um, electrical boxes, you can stick in by uh, putting a, a stake on the back of it and pounding it into the bale and then plastering around it. That's, that's a common way that's done. Um, um, those are the two, two main ways. Same thing with the plumbing? Yeah. Do you have to use conduit? Uh, no, no, it's, it's not a bad idea, but you don't have to. I'm, very few owner builders I know use conduit. They just bail, put it in the wall. How do you deal with the codes? I mean, either city or county. We don't. We don't have any building codes. You don't have any building codes in, in the county. No. Nope. So there hasn't been an issue. When we bought the when we bought the property for the eco village, the day we bought it, we could have built as many buildings of whatever type we wanted, as long as we didn't subdivide it. We do have subdivision uh, ordinances, and um, we. Uh, uh, we, when we originally built the Eco Village project, we, we did it with leased land, so people would get a 200-year lease on the property for their house, and um, the county was happy with that and didn't require us to go through subdivision approval. But we've, one of the big, larger builders in town that's wanted to build at the Eco Village, he wanted to actually be able to sell lots to people, so we recently went through the county and got a subdivision approval and uh, spent the money to, to do that. What, what advice would you have for someone who would want to try to build a straw house maybe in Blackhawk County or Greenwood County? 
Well, I'd, I'd look at these, uh, I'd look at these um, building codes and um, really, the, you know, if you're gonna build a straw, I wouldn't try to build a load-bearing straw bale. I'd try to build a, um, a uh, infill straw bale. And the infill straw bale, it's really just cellulose insulation. You know, it's, it's so, so I'd, you know, make the argument is, you know, I'm gonna build a post and beam building and I could, I could put a, uh, a frame wall in there, I could put this straw bale insulated wall in there. And um, generally not a big problem. Uh, but I'll, I, you know, I'd be interesting to hear what you come up with. How many pounds of a bale do you want? What's the ideal pound? Uh, uh, they they wanna be fairly dense. Um, it's a trade off because you gotta pick up hundreds of them. And so uh, as somebody who, uh, my family had some cows when I was young and I spent all summer baling straw, uh, hay. Um, but typically these are two string bales and they weigh somewhere around 60 pounds, 70 pounds. Seven, 60 to 70. Is it yeah. wheat straw or? We, we use whatever we can get. Hay or? We, we, we use, well, uh, typ typically people avoid using hay. I, I'm from Maine originally and there's very little grain growing that goes on there and it's very inexpensive and hard to get actual straw. Everybody know the difference between straw and hay? Some people don't. Okay, if you, it, straw is you take the cereal grain off and it's just cellulose. Hay is, um, uh, is a field where you cut uh, a, a mixture of grasses and it often has um, seed heads and other things that might be edible to uh, in, in attractive to insects and things like that. So there's been a concern that hay would be more attractive to insects versus straw. But I know people who've built with, straw, with hay in Maine and it's just fine. You know, you play plaster them, they haven't had a lot of trouble with them, but typically straw. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank again, you. Lonnie. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it.